all day long. Like, that fits well. But that was over some bad peanut butter. David, in this passage, is feeling agony over his own sin that has been keeping, or that he has been keeping in the dark. When do we experience that? Have you ever experienced that? I don't think many of us can say that we relate to David and how we feel about our own sin. At the very least, we might be able to relate to his stubbornness to keep it in the dark. Because you see, we live in a world and a generation that are expert manufacturers of their own image. Right? You guys know. We, we have trained ourselves to walk in darkness and project outwardly whatever we want others to see of us. And in a space like this, it's really easy to just project the, oh, I'm a church attender, I'm a church kid, I'm a, I'm a whatever you want to title it. And you can manufacture your relationship with Jesus to everyone else around you. But what might you be trying to cover up next high school? What might you be hiding that is eating away at your life and joy? See, David in this passage, he has this realization about what keeping his life and sin hidden is doing to him. He says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. This is the first step in the direction of confession. This is experiencing a conviction. Conviction in this sense is simply an acknowledgement that something is not right. Something feels off and something seems to be stirring deep within me and I'm not sure it's good. I'm not sure it's of God. And friends, the things that you feel this way about in your life are only going to get worse the longer you keep quiet. Just like when I was sick with food poisoning. I wanted nothing more than to just lay still in my bed in the dark for hours on end. But what I knew I needed was help. I needed the things that my body was losing. I needed electrolytes. I needed water. I needed potassium, sodium, all the things that my body needs to get better. Otherwise, I wasn't going to enjoy the rest of my vacation. I wasn't going to get better. And in the same way, David acknowledges what he needs. He acknowledges his need for the only one who could heal him of his condition. In verse 4, it says, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. All right, what we see here is that conviction doesn't feel good. Some of you, you hear David in this passage, and he's telling God, God, your hand is heavy upon me, and you think that sounds oppressive and harsh of God. But friends, that is the grace and mercy of a loving God on a broken and weary sinner. I asked you earlier if you ever felt so deeply over your sin that it made you sick. If you haven't yet, you definitely will at some point. Whether you're a believer in Jesus or you're not. Um, and I have, one time. It was during the fall of my senior year of high school. I had received a call on my life to pursue high school ministry, but I was living in that season a hypocritical and sinful lifestyle with a girl that I was dating. And truthfully, I didn't feel all that bad about it. But I remember like it was yesterday, there was this night where I had acted on this sin again. But I, rather than moving on and just tucking it in the dark like I always did, I immediately began to feel sick. And in that moment, I knew that this was not just some random feeling, but I was actually feeling and understanding the weight of my sin really for the first time. It was conviction. I felt physically ill, but I knew that it was a spiritual issue. And I sensed just as soon as I had felt sick that this was the grace of God on my life. And conviction doesn't feel good. I want to say that again. But even still, I could breathe because I knew without a doubt that the Holy Spirit was telling me, you need to find freedom in Christ. 
that I needed to bring this to the light, that I needed to stop living this way because it was killing me and hurting others and that he loved me way too much to leave me here. Some of you need to hear that tonight. God loves you way too much to leave you where you are. And he was convicting me of my sin and so I responded. I confessed to him that I no longer wanted to hide my life from him. I no longer wanted to live my own way. I trusted that his way and his life for me would be far better and far more worth it. I confessed to him, and over the next couple of months, I began to confess to people in my life. I confessed to my mentor, and I confessed to my high school pastor. And a little later on, I I finally confessed to my peers, because they didn't know the things that I was doing in the dark. They got the image that I wanted them to have. And freedom was experience because I understood how my sin had taken me captive. And I understood how forgiveness towards me broke me out of that. And so I stopped living like a prisoner. Some of you need to ask God to make you ill over your sin tonight. Some of you need to ask God to make you ill over your sin tonight. Because he can do that. He can give you new desires. He will give you new desires, and that's good news. You see, confession is the correct response to conviction, and conviction is the grace and mercy of a loving God on a hurting and broken sinner. Now, as we continue tonight, I want to address the question of why do we confess? See, David says in verse 5, he says, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Here's something I've noticed as I've lived the Christian life over the past four and a half years. It's way too easy for us to read something in Scripture and just assume that we are always on the Jesus team. To just assume that we are always the good guys in the passage. And so we sometimes read about the forgiveness of Jesus and we somehow feel entitled to it. So we just go about life with a low view of Jesus and even a lower view of sin. And see, I think there's a handful in this room tonight who have been wrestling with this idea of, hey, Jesus died for nothing if I don't sin a little bit. Jesus died for nothing if I don't sin a lot of it. And friends, I've heard that plenty of times. That's cheap grace. If you're a believer in Christ and and you, you have trusted that his death on the cross was the absolute payment for your sin and yet you still hold that mindset, this is what you're saying. Jesus, I see the cross, I understand what that meant for you to die for me, but I am gonna continue living in a way that only contributes to your death on the cross. That's cheap grace. Because it costs him everything. And that's walking through life, keeping all of your sin in the darkness, but making other people think you love Jesus. But that's not loving Jesus. That's selling the grace of God for a lie, and that is missing the forgiveness of Jesus that is on offer. And friends, I'm not trying to be harsh with you tonight. It's a heavy message. But I am trying to help you see. Next high school, I want nothing more than for all of you to leave this room tonight more in love with Jesus. Because you actually grasp what his forgiveness means for you. And if conviction is the first step towards confession, then I think that we see here that confession is the first step towards true forgiveness. So why do we confess? We confess to experience the freedom of forgiveness. We do not confess to make God love us more. We do not confess to make God love us more. We confess to experience the freedom of following a forgiving God. Now, there's an image that I really love to think about um, and, and paint for people when I think about the forgiveness of Jesus. I want you to, just for a second, just imagine uh, you're in a courtroom and there is a criminal standing before a judge. This criminal has done some horrible, horrible things like heinous, evil crimes. In just a few moments, he's going to be convicted and sentenced. The death penalty 
for their crime. But just as the judge goes to declare the criminal guilty, the judge stands up, steps off the platform, steps down to the criminal, looks him face to face and says, you're free to go. And in the same breath, you see the judge hand out his wrists in front of the criminal and you watch as the officer takes the cuffs off the criminal, puts the cuffs on the judge. Not only that, but the judge instructs the officer to hand over to the criminal all of his belongings. His car keys, his bank account info, everything that this man has now belongs to the criminal. And as the judge moves away to go and take on the death sentence in his place, he looks into the criminal's eyes and says, your crime has been paid for. Go and live differently. I want you to ask yourself, what would you do if you were that criminal? What would you do if you were that criminal? Would you walk out of that courtroom and just brush it off like, man, I wasn't even guilty, it's whatever. Or would you walk out of there and say, I was so guilty. I was so guilty and man, I I have no choice but to be transformed by the incomprehensible grace that I was just shown by a judge who owed me nothing. What would you do? Friends, this is the kind of forgiveness that Jesus has on offer. He stepped down from his throne in heaven to stand across from you, guilty where you stand, and make the payment that is required to cancel out your crimes. It's perfect justice, and it's perfect mercy. And not only that, just like the judge gave the criminal everything that belonged to him, we receive the inheritance that belongs to Jesus. First Peter says it's imperishable, it's unending, it's undefiled. You see, we receive the righteousness of Jesus, which just means when God looks at you, he sees Jesus and not your mess. And you can experience that kind of forgiveness, you can experience it by continually living in a way that magnifies the power of the grace of Jesus. I can't, but you can. James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So be honest where you're at. Be honest with the people around you who are following Jesus, because you have to do this in community with others. We're all criminals. None of us has ever deserved forgiveness. And with others, respond to the convictions in your heart by confessing your sin. And when you confess, man, thank God that he has already shown you this mercy. And when you do that, you will be healed, the scripture says. You'll be transformed. Your life will be lived differently because you will be living in the freedom of forgiveness. And I want to plead with you tonight, next high school, all of you who are here, new faces, old faces, all of you, I want to plead with you, don't go back to the prison cell. You don't belong there anymore if you know Jesus. I've talked to some of you last week. You have experienced the freedom, but then you seem to have lost it along the way. Maybe you go to a camp or a retreat and you experience some sort of camp high and you finally decide, man, I'm going to take my sins seriously and I'm going to chase after Jesus. And in cabin time, I confessed all my sin to my cabin mates and I cried. And a month later, you feel like you're right back where you started, stuck in the prison cell. And that's because so many of us neglect to continue living in the light and confessing. And my third point is how do we confess? We need to be specific about our sin struggles. We need to be specific about our sin struggles. I was listening to a sermon yesterday, and in that sermon, the pastor said something 
that I think we can really benefit from tonight. He said this, the heart that tells is the heart that's well. The heart that tells is the heart that's well. So when you receive conviction over your sin, the easiest way to tell if your heart is healthy is if you are willing to tell about it. And I would say that the most freeing way to confess is to be as specific as possible about the things that you're struggling with. I want to look back at the beginning of this passage, verse 2. Verse 2, it says, Blessed is the man against the against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Those last couple words are standing out to me. In whose spirit there is no deceit. What God is saying to us tonight is that there is no more need for deception. There is no need to hide anything anymore. So I'll simply just challenge you to be specific. It's a practical application tonight. Be specific. Begin to live in a way where there is nothing for people in your life to find out about. If you can think right now about something in your life that you would never share, that you think, hey, man, I'm never, ever, ever going to say, say that to someone. They can never know I did that. I would probably start there and tell someone. Confess to your small group, your leader, whoever it might be. You can come talk to me, Laura. Someone that could be praying for you and be specific. What happened? Why did that happen? How were you feeling in that moment? Where did it go? What was the context? What else was going on in your life that maybe led you there? How has it hurt you? Be specific. My accountability group always starts our meetings. Uh, we actually meet on Thursday morning, so I'm going to call them tomorrow. And um, we talk about how we fed our flesh, our faith, and our friends. Practical application if you want to write that down. How have you fed your flesh, your faith, and your friends? You go around and you kind of share, you know, because what you feed grows. If you feed something, it will grow. That's how creation works. That's how we work. That's how our brains work. Um, so if you're feeding your flesh, your faith, your friends, they will grow. And so we kind of go around, hey, man, this, this, this thing I did this week, I, I, man, I shouldn't have looked at that. I shouldn't have clicked on that. Um, I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have said that to that person or thought that about that person. Um, and that was really feeding that bitterness in my heart, and that was feeding that lust, and that was feeding that thing. And so we kind of talk through that, and, man, we pray for each other. Uh, and then we, we move on, and we say, hey, man, how have you been feeding others? How have you been feeding your friends? Faith, friends, faith. No, flesh, friends, faith. Um, and how have you been pouring into other people? Are you ignoring the people in your life, or are you investing in them? We all do student ministry, man. How are you pouring into students? And so we talk about that. We pray for certain people in our lives, and we just discuss that and encourage each other. And then lastly, we say, how have you been feeding your faith? Because what we feed grows. How have you been feeding your faith? What is your time with God looking like recently? And are, are, you, are you struggling to pray are you in that season where you're like, God, stand before me and talk to me face to face? Or are you like, man, I'm okay, God, I believe in faith that you hear me? Um, wherever it is, just encourage each other. Faith, friends, flesh, be specific about your sin struggles. Bring them to the light. You see, light isn't selective about what it illuminates. It simply just reveals whatever is there. See, this is, it says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light. This is 1 John 1. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
I'm going to invite the band back out, close out tonight. Um, but yeah, that's, that's from 1 John 1. It's a great passage on confession. If you walk in the light, you will walk together in fellowship. And the blood of Jesus will cover your sin. That is a life of following Jesus, and that is a life of healing. See, confession is the right response to conviction. We confess to experience the freedom of forgiveness, and we confess by being specific about our sin struggles. I want to go back to a question I asked you in the beginning of the message. Who is covering your sin? Next high school, who is covering your sin? My hope tonight is that you would leave this place and see that there is a life and death difference between you covering your sin and Jesus covering your sin. When you try to cover your sin, you waste away hopelessly, and one day all of the darkness in you will be seen. But God loved us so much that he made it possible for us to find a new life of freedom, and he did that by Jesus' death on the cross. There's no more room for deception. The evidence is clear. Jesus' death on the cross was the payment for everything we owed to him. And his blood was shed so that our sin could truly be covered. And God, because of that, he looks at those who believe and he sees no sin. Every ounce of rebellion and lust and disobedience is covered. And what he sees is the payment he made to get us back to him. Because of that, it no, it no longer matters what people know about your darkness. Because the king of the universe, the God who created everything, declared you who were guilty innocent because of Jesus. If you're, if you're not sure who's covering your sin, might I ask you to consider asking Jesus to do that for you tonight? Because he desires to. It's who he is. He wants to make you well. Someone in this room tonight feels like their whole life is a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. And he made you. And he made you with the intention of knowing him and being in relationship with him. Someone in this room, who feel, they feel like they don't need to hear about sin or the gospel anymore you've gotten over the gospel, have you ever actually received it? We never graduate from the gospel. I believe in faith that God wants to adopt some sinners into his family tonight. God wants to grant new life in Christ to the prideful and the shameful and the broken and the weary. And he's going to do that for you who believe the gospel. All right, so this is the gospel. God made you to know him. God created everything. He created this world. He created you to know him. Your sin separated you from him. You can't get back to God on your own. It's impossible. And so Jesus paid the debt of your sin when he died and he rose again. And through trusting in Jesus alone, not anything else, you receive life. You receive life that you were intended to live now and forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's the gospel. That's the good news that Jesus calls us to believe with our whole heart. And tonight we're talking about confession. But some of you need to first just confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's what I'm seeing about the world that we live in, about the country we live in, about the community and the schools and the place that we live, there's no more room for nominal Christianity. Our world's gonna weed out those who believe with conviction that Jesus is Lord and those who don't. It's just gonna happen. And like we talked about earlier, if God is convicting you right now, about the reality that he truly is Lord, then respond and confess. 
Check this out. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 through 10, if you confess with your mouth, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, no one else can do that for you. You can't manufacture that. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead for you, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Everyone bow your heads. Close your eyes. Don't distract each other. I want you to imagine Jesus right now with all the biases and the perceptions and the knowledge that you may have about him. Close your eyes, bow your heads, imagine Jesus. Do you see him standing there with a pointed finger? Do you see him standing before you angry and disappointed? That's not what Jesus says about himself. Jesus says that he is gentle and lowly. And he's not standing there with a pointed finger. He's kneeling with open arms, ready for you to run to him. And if you want to put your faith in Christ tonight and be saved for forever, you just pray with me right now. If that's you, if you want to be saved, you want to know Jesus, you want to get to know him, and you see him right now with his open arms, God, reveal your grace to them. Would you pray with me if that's you right now in your heart? God, I have rebelled against you. Everything I've ever done in my life has contributed to your death on the cross. That's all I can bring to you. But God, right now, I believe that you are convicting me to humble myself before you and say, you are Lord. And if that's you, friends, I just want you to confess right now. Commit to confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's no other Lord like him. I just pray, Jesus, and if that's you, Jesus, I believe in a faith that you paid for my sin on that cross. That you were on that cross and you thought of me and you saw me and you said, okay, I will do it. And God, I don't deserve it, but I believe in faith that you actually did that for me. And so I receive it, God. I believe in you and I ask for salvation. He'll give it to you. Amen. Keep, keep your heads bowed. Keep your eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer, man, you, you put your faith in Jesus tonight. In just a few moments, I want to just ask you to look up at me. I know we do this you know, every now and then, but man, I just feel like we got to give opportunity for people to make that confession. Um, so I just, I just want to ask in a couple of moments that you would look up at me if that was you. Just make eye contact with me. Um, I just want to see who you are. I want to pray for you. I want to acknowledge you. And then you can put your head back down. And I want you to know that looking up at me does not save you. That saying a prayer in this room tonight doesn't even save you. But Jesus Christ alone and your faith in him is what saves you. And some of you have been manufacturing a relationship with Jesus. But you are realizing right now that you have never actually surrendered your heart to him and trusted him for real. So with nobody looking around, you who just prayed that prayer, who trusted in Jesus for the first time tonight, on the count of three, I'm going to ask that you would just look up at me. And I'm going to make eye contact with you. I'm going to see you. And then, and then after that, you can put your head back down. So one, looking up doesn't save you. 
Two, trusting in Jesus Christ alone is what saves you. And three, you can go ahead and look up at me. I see you. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Oh. Come on. That's you. I see you. Yes. Yes, I see you. Yep. Keep looking. I see you guys. What a gift. Man, I love this. If you looked up, you can, you can bow your head again. And if you trusted in Jesus tonight, whether you looked up at me or not, I would just encourage you before you leave to tell someone. Y'all can look up. All of you. If that was you, tell somebody about it because the heart that's well is the heart that tells. I want to end tonight by just reading Psalm 32 and we're going to go back and do a time of worship. Psalm 32, I'm going to read it in a different translation. Uh, this is a little bit more of a poetic translation. Here's what it says, friends. Just listen to this. Just receive this. It says, oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are in, lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. Verse 7, for you are my hiding place. You protected me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Verse 10, many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. Y'all can stand up. We are going to continue worshiping Jesus. I'm going to get my table out of here so Michaela can get up here. But let's just pray. God, thank you. I love Wednesday nights because you meet us here. God, you rescue, you rescue sinners from their rebellion every single week. And I praise you that you continue to heal us from our sin, that you continue to make us more like you, that we have a lifetime ahead of you and then forever and ever and ever and ever to get to know you, God. I love you, Jesus. I love these students, but you love them so much more. Uh, so we praise you, God. We worship you. And I pray that these students would see you right now with your open arms, God, on your knees, welcoming us in as a perfect, loving father. Would they run to you right now, Jesus? In your name I pray.